Okay, we're back in the late afternoon with a really special show. Community matters, but we're talking about the Transpac. Um, this is the 50th anniversary of the Transpac, and the Transpac is a race. And both of our guests are heavily involved in, in uh, sailboat racing and the Transpac. So at my far, my far left, Paul Wheeler, uh, he, is, he owns a 38-foot boat called the Maka'oi. Maka'oi. Maka -oi. Okay, and, um, and he is the uh, staff commodore of the Transpac Yacht Club. Okay, and then to his, um, to my immediate left is Carl uh, Geringer. He owns a 42-foot sailboat called the Makoa 2. Yeah. That's correct. Okay, and uh, he is the uh, what, chair of the Honolulu Committee. Of the race, correct. Of the race, of the Transpac race, again for the Transpac Yacht Club. These are very important guys because it's a very important race. I mean, they've been dedicated to it all their lives, really, and uh, this, is, this is where the rubber meets the road. The sail meets the road, so to speak. <laughs> what does the Transpac mean? Okay, what does it mean to Hawaii? What does it mean to racing? Okay, uh, the... Uh, the Los Angeles to Honolulu Transpac race is a 2,225 nautical mile yacht race from off Point Furman in San Pedro, and it finishes at Diamond Head Buoy, and it's got one mark of the course, which is the west end of Catalina, which most boats get around about hour three or four after the start. And this race started in 1906. Uh, it was originally thought of by King David Kalakaua. Really? Uh, who wanted to uh, organize a race. That would be up. after it, the overthrow. He was still active. Yes, yeah? yes. Uh, the race didn't come to pass during his time, but he was the one who sent the first challenge out to the mainland. He was very globally minded. And uh, McFarlane, a uh, name everybody knows, sailed his yacht from Hawaii to San Francisco in 1906 to accept a challenge from uh, boats up in San Francisco Yacht Club. And the day he sailed into San Francisco in 1906 was the day the earthquake in San Francisco was oh, on no. fire. And back then, and look what happened. And back yes. then, sailboats had cotton sails and cotton burns. So they decided the safest thing to do was immediately turn around, sail Get back out, out the Golden Gate, and down to Los Angeles. And then, uh, so the race then started that year in Los Angeles to Honolulu. And it's, that's how it's been run ever since. It sounds and, like it, it's, uh, the race is deeply embedded with Hawaii history. Yes. Huh? Right uh, back to the royalty. Uh, and the uh, overall corrected winner trophy is the Kalakaua Cup. And it's beautiful. It's priceless. And it's been awarded 50 times. Yeah. And there are people in Hawaii who race. I mean, there are some yes. of the, the boats that, that race uh, that come from Hawaii. They're yes. home ported here. Home ported here, and they sail up to Los Angeles to, to race it. Um, and it's not just the racers, though. It takes about 600 volunteers, uh, both on the Los Angeles side and Long Beach, to organize it and send them, get them started. And then the Honolulu Committee, which uh, Carl manages, is about 500 volunteers that That's perform major. a lot of yes. different functions. Major, and, and um, I know the Diamond Head buoy is just the seaward of, of the Diamond Head Light, right? That's correct. And that's where the Coast Guard Admiral's house, house is at. That's correct. We have to, every, every race, we have to gain permission from the mainland to utilize the lighthouse and, and receive the Admiral's permission because that's his private property. Ah. So three <laughs> people at a time are allowed up in the Diamond Head Lighthouse, and if you've never been there, it's an incredible experience. I have experience. been there. I was in the Coast Guard. So. So, <laughs> yes, and so you go up in that lighthouse, and... There's actually a tube up there that's sighted right across the Diamond Head buoy, and a person actually looks through that tube while another See person's on the clock, on an official clock, oh, wow. and they mark it when they cross, and then the communications begin, and the whole welcoming ceremony and everything starts happening. Oh, it's exactly. spectacular, really. I've seen some of it. Have you gentlemen crewed on, on, on boats that have made the trip? Yeah. Uh, I, I did sail my first trans pack in 1975 when I was in college. <laughs> Took 13 and a half days. Yeah, how'd you do? Uh, not great, but we had a great time. <laughs> what are the challenges of crewing? I mean, first of all, you can't get seasick, right? Never. It's not permitted. <laughs> That's right. 
But there's a lot of physical labor involved. It's not only physical labor, it's mental labor, because it, each person has a, you know, a responsibility not only to themselves, but to every crew member on board. And so it team. really teaches teamwork. Yeah. Well, you talked before about the uh, technology on these boats, and I, I'd like to spend a minute on that. Um, Bo, you were saying that there's, there's a lot of new technology, um, and, and that makes the competition all the more uh, competitive. What kind of technology are we talking about? Well, you know, in, in the old days, back in the 50s, uh, the boats were made of wood. And then in the 60s, they were made of fiberglass. And then they were made of fiberglass with foam cores to be stronger and lighter. And then the real breakthroughs, really, this came out of America's Cup technology, uh, was building boats of solid carbon fiber. Very expensive. You've got to build big ovens to bake these holes. Oh, I'm in. sure. And then it evolved and not just hulls, every part on the boat, the winches, the toilet seats, uh, the steering wheels, all made out of carbon. Then they took it to another layer and they started building the masts out of carbon fiber and the shrouds. And this is just very, very expensive, but the boats get lighter and lighter and faster and faster. Can you explain the physics of, of that to me? I mean, so they're lighter. Why does that necessarily mean they're faster? Um, light, does light mean fast? Uh, yeah, because the boats get up in plane where they basically can reduce their wetted surface the faster they go and the lighter you make the boat. And they use a lot of uh, technology around the keels and making the keels more efficient and deeper so they get more leverage so they can put more sail up, bigger mass, bigger rigs. All that gives more power. So if you've got more, it's like a race car. You've got a, a bigger engine but a lighter uh, chassis. The car's going to go faster, same with boats. And the sails, uh, I assume the sails should be lighter too. So the last time I looked at one of these sails, it was heavy. Uh, they gotten lighter? Uh, well, they've gotten stronger, and they're basically made out of exotic materials now um, that hold their shapes perfect for longer periods, but they're much more expensive now. That's right. And yes, they're not, they're not light because the, the sail rigs, the sail plans have gotten bigger. They've got to be strong because tearing would, would not work on a race, right. if at all. You know? Right. So, you know, what, what about the navigational equipment? Has that changed? Well, going back to the 50s, I mean, we didn't have GPS. We didn't have all the satellites up there. They were doing um, um, sextant navigation, navigating by the stars. And they didn't have the radio communications we, ha we have today. Um, they were much on their own once they left on the race because the communication was not the same way as we have it today. No tracking systems, etc. Today's race is all about safety. That's the number one consideration. And so a lot of the equipment is all about system, backup system, and safety just in case something does happen out there that there's a way to you know, recover from that mm -hmm. situation. But the, but the navigators, each boat has a navigator, and Transpac is called a navigator's race. There's a lot of uh, navigating this. You do not sail a straight line to Hawaii because of the Pacific High. So the real question is, how far do you go south, and then how close to the Pacific High do you pass because the winds get lighter to Hawaii? Oh, so so yeah. the navigators make all the calls on this. Yeah, so I really would like to know about that. I mean, it's all about tacking, right, and dealing well, it's with... It's jiving the... downwind, but yeah. Okay, sorry, uh, I, that's not the right term. Yeah, but, but to Hawaii, you sail what's called a reverse S-course. So the rum line would be a straight line, yeah. but there's this thing called the Pacific High, and that's what generates the trade winds that sits out there. Okay. Well, in the middle of the high, there's no wind. Okay. So the question is, you got to sail, you know, if a straight line is the shortest distance, but you got to sail, you're trying to do this as a navigator, how do I keep the boat going as right. fast as possible, knowing how to sail more miles, but not too many more miles in the competition at all, at all times, and jibe angles, and have, you know, experts. And that's why a navigator's worth the sure. their most important guy on the boat. He saves you going places you don't need to go. go. <laughs> and, Hopefully. And, and he tells you when to tack. He tells the... I guess the captain, he jive. tells the captain yeah. when to tack, yeah. uh, which is very important because that, that's critical. In, in, Keep in, the angles the efficient. Angles and, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Ooh, exciting. And, uh, and the captain, who is the captain on a boat like this? It's generally the owner, the guy writing the checks. Okay, but it doesn't have to be. Oh, well, no, he can, the owner, if he wants to, or is too old to uh, 
not not go, then he assigns a skipper who runs the boat in his absence. Professional. Generally a professional right. hired skipper. And these are world class. A lot of these are America's Cup skippers. They're out on the pro circuit sailing around the world. This is at the top end of the fleet. Yeah. Oh, exciting. Let's talk metrics for a minute. Okay. How, how long? How wide? How much displacement? Uh, what's the size of the crew? I'll break that down. How long? How wide? Uh, some boats only have a crew of two. Um, some boats have a crew of 20. It just all depends on, you know, the, the bigger, the more manpower it takes many times. Uh, there's the Aloha class, which is essentially a cruising class, and many of them head over as if they're cruising to Hawaii, but they're racing. And they, it's more casual. It's though. more casual, and they, yes, they can do margaritas at happy hour. <laughs> <laughs> well, not, so not the real serious ones. They don't no. do that. <laughs> so it, it just all depends on where the comfort level of the skipper and you know, from a safety perspective, also from a comfort perspective, and how long your watch is going to be, et cetera. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. And how fast do they go? And how long does it take them to get from Long Beach to Hawaii? Well, the fleet ranges in size from 31 feet to 100 feet. And the 100-foot record was set last race by Comanche, which is uh, entered again with a new owner this time from Australia. It was, a US, Australia it was a U.S. owner when it was originally built. And uh, they did the course last time in five days, one hour, and a couple minutes. Which is kind of a record. That, yeah, that's that was, really that's, fast. That, that set yeah. the record. And we also set the multi-hull record last year at a little over four, four days. Okay. Um, and they carry all their food. They carry all their water. Nobody resupplies them. Nope. No. Uh, and they have, do they have, um, I don't know if you know this fellow, Bill Meyer. He's a physicist from Stanford. He has a boat. He sails all oceans. And he has a little phone about that big. Yes, and yes. It's a, it's these boats, satellite these boats have satellite phones, and that's how they send their email positions in. If they have a safety issue, uh, they can call us, and we'll get, get the Coast Guard hooked up. They also use their satellite phone capabilities to download weather information. Oh, sure. Each boat has a transponder on it, uh, and Yellow Bricks are vendor for tracking, and everyone on the race and everyone at home can go online and pull down the position on all their competitors in the race. I was going to ask you. We about do it on a race. since it's a navigator's race, and if the navigator wants to put a move on a competitor, we uh, put a four-hour delay on the uh, public public view <laughs> so on the can't find tracker. out where you are in real time. Right. Right. <laughs> um, you know, because if, if somebody has an idea, I want to go south you know, for the next two hours, we don't want to let them signal it what their, their move is. They'll find out four hours from now, but... You can um, learn from watching the other guy's moves, right? Right. But, That's right. Uh, so, I mean, the whole fleet's kind of watching, but mainly the, the individual classes. The fleet's broken down for handicap purposes into classes. So, it's so you're really in a race yeah. against your class. Yeah, yeah. So, but you do watch how the guys in front of you, the bigger boats are doing and how they're moving because you take that information in and your decision as a navigator. It must be really thrilling to be on a race like this. I mean, whether you're in a cruising class boat or a competitive, I mean, uh, what's the, what would you call the other kind? Oh, you know, Grand Prix. Grand Prix, Prix town, right. you know. It must be really exciting. I mean, I remember seeing photos of uh, them, them hanging off the, uh, the sail during the attack, and they all the way back. <laughs> they're, they're over the water, am I right? This is pretty thrilling. Um, yeah, it's... It's pretty wet. These boats are pretty wet when they're going very fast. Yeah. Um, some of these boats, as Carl has mentioned before, we've, uh, one of the big uh, uh, multi hulls, uh, Maserati, uh, Carl's sailed on it before, and they've hit, would you say, 45 knots. 45 knots, and you know, sustained 35 knots is not a problem at all. You go through bursts of speed, but it's just, it's something you've never experienced and you never will. Your Unless adrenaline's you, running all the time. It, it is. And uh, to sleep below decks, because I went on it from Okinawa, Japan, to Hong Kong after the last Transpac race, um, it's like a freight train is running right beside the boat all night long, because that's how fast you're going well, this through the noise, water. This yes. noise, the sound of the water. The sound of the water, noisy. yes. You never have a moment of rest, I guess. Uh, you get tired, so yes, you do, but in just, you know, small little... You know, doses you, you, of sleep. You catch a little sleep right. when you can. That's right. Wow. You have to be strong, don't you? I mean, not, not everybody can do this. Uh, so who, who qualifies? I and mean, how do they select the crews? 
The guys who, you know, pull the winches and climb the mast, they climb the mast. Yeah. And, uh, that, you know, that requires a lot, especially because the boat is moving at yeah, They're, they're knots. not climbing yeah. the mast. Someone's grinding them up, up the mast. Up the mast. Okay, but, right. but they're hanging on to the shrap to, yeah. to go up the mast. So how do you find people that can do this? I'm sure that, you know, they don't grow on trees. Maybe they grow on masts. Well, in, in a lot of cases, most cases, people start in junior programs in yachting. And like mm -hmm. the three yacht clubs here in Hawaii have good junior programs. And then you get asked, you know, on the dock to maybe go out on a bigger size boat and you perform there and you get asked out again. Uh, a lot of our kids go off to uh, sail in college and they get invited because they're strong college sailors to go sail on some of these boats. Some of them are in mm -hmm. junior uh, Olympic training programs and get asked to go crew on some of these boats just in the background. Uh, some people just pick it up on their dock at their local club and start tr sailing, you know, without junior experience, just going down on the beer can races and start crewing. And if they have an aptitude toward it and take, they just do it over time. They learn the, learn the job. Mm. You know, um, I mean, this is important for Hawaii in terms of the Hawaii history of it, although not everybody knows about it. Maybe it's, we should discuss it. We are discussing it for that reason. Um, you know, but I wonder where the Transpac race fits in the, in the world of racing. Because you mentioned, what was it, uh, 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 the cup? The Kalo Kalo Cup. Yeah. The, the, okay. Overall corrected There's a lot of the cups, race. Right? Yeah. And, and a lot of races uh, in, in every continent, I suppose, and people have these fabulous boats. They can go there and participate. And I, and I wonder where the Transpac fits in the landscape of, of global sailboat racing. Well, Transpac and the Newport Bermuda race, which is the major East right. Coast race, start in the same year. And they're the two oldest continuous running blue ocean uh, races in the world. And Transpac's always considered uh, one of the top five races in the world, a bucket race for almost everybody to go get your ticket punch that you've done at <laughs> Transpac. Do it, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's what keeps people coming back or new, new boats from all around the world coming to race. Um, and part of it is uh, it's a race primarily downwind, off the wind, and it gets warmer every day you're on the race. Not and bad. at the end, you right. know, the last few thirds of the race, you're in shorts and t shirts, <laughs> and you generally don't have to wear fall weather gear at that time. <laughs> uh, so it's, and, it's, and it's famous for its finish. Every boat gets a, its own arrival party when it gets to Oahu, and oh. no other race in the world does that. I want to talk about that after the break. That's Bo Wheeler and Carl Berenger, Geringer, and uh, both captains of their own boats and both heavily involved in Transpac. Um, after this break, I want to talk about some of the emergency gear you carry, and I want to talk about what it's like when people arrive in July. Ooh, I want, to, I want, to, I want you to put me there. Put me there at Diamond Head. <laughs> okay. And tell me what it's like. We'll be right back after this break. Aloha. I'm Lauren Pear host here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you'd go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks so much. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence, leadership, and finding greatness. I interview guests who are successful in business, sports, and life, which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness. Join me every Monday as we go Beyond the Lines at 11 a.m. Aloha. Okay, we got Bo Wheeler, he's a Commodore, or a staff Commodore. What's a Commodore? Well, Trans-Pacific Yacht Club is an organization that organizes and runs the race. Uh, it was started in 1926. It's the governing body for the race. There's a board of directors that we both sit on, um, and there's about 25 uh, members on the board. And uh, we put together the notice of race, the sailing instructions, what rules the race is going to be conducted on. And a big part of that is what are the safety 
uh, requirements that we run for the race. So let's talk about that. I mean, I, I, what I get, by the way, from what you said is that this is the headquarters for the race. This is where that committee meets, I mean, the board. This is the, the it happens here where you make the rules. It happens here when you create all the, you know, procedural requirements and schedules and we take entries for people who are, am I right? It's happening right here. Uh, well, it's, it, it, the board members of lots of different yacht clubs around the country. Uh, and we, we do meet sometimes on the West Coast. We often just do it by phone, but it's the organizing, uh, organizing group. And for safety, uh, we've never had a safety incident, and we're renowned for being, having the highest safety standards Not of all races. Not cool, yes. And um, uh, if there are incidents of sailing uh, accidents around the world, uh, members of our organization are often recruited to be part of the investigative body doing the incident reports and writing conclusions afterwards and often the recommendations that come out of that. Oh, you do debriefing after each yeah, race. Yeah. You learn from every race. Well, and accidents where yeah, the Coast yeah. Guard may ask us to be part of the Right, right. Review. Because they're going to do an investigation yes. too, yeah. And, uh, and so the international yachting community often adopts those recommendations. So the safety standards go up every year. What about uh, the safety equipment? Yeah, and that's part of the standards. I mean, if you were going well, to boats are required to have certain kinds of equipment. Yeah, okay. Yes, every boat, and we have inspections before they can leave Long Beach. They have to have all that gear on board, and then we have inspections here when they arrive That's good. to make sure they have it all and they That's save good. weight. They didn't leave it on the dock because <laughs> right. uh, that would save some weight and for the average and lighter yeah, and faster. Yeah, for the average <laughs> owner, you know, if you're going to do your first trans pack and you haven't been playing the game, it's probably forty thousand in safety equipment. Wow. Uh, you got to have life rafts. You have to have EPIRB uh, beacons. Beacons. Yeah. Uh, most boats have personal beacons for all the. You got to have inflatable safety. You got uh, ra uh, gear on the. You got to have harnesses. You got to have tethers to mm -hmm. snap you onto jack lines on the boat uh, when you go overboard. You got to have strobe lights, uh, whistles. You got to have satellite phones. You got to have life raft, emergency uh, gifts. Gear to drop over the board if someone goes aside. You got to have man overboard buttons at the helm, which marks a GPS position if someone goes overboard. Somebody goes overboard. Somebody put at the helm. Somebody pushes a button. Marks now a we GPS. know where that person is. Throw them a life a life raft or a life uh, uh, ring. Yeah, and then and then you you try to stop the stop the sailboat. It's, it's you, you have someone spill, looking at that the person. Sails, somebody you, watching him. It, yeah, yeah. this would be yeah. harder if the seas were high. Though. Right, it is. Right. Yeah. So that gear generally you drop over uh, generally automatically inflates uh, a pole with a flag on it to help and a strobe to help see so in the waves. In some length, yeah. And hopefully the swimmer sees it. To, the man overboard can swim to that to make it easier to recover him. And that's the one thing you worry about more than anything. Somebody goes overboard right. in, in high seas in a fast maneuver, right. and then you lose them somehow. You can't find them, yeah. and then right. you're open ocean. Yeah. yeah. So. Everyone worries about that. So, you know, and safety is the highest standards on these races yeah, and the yeah. gear. Every system you could possibly have, you want to have. So, um, uh, Carl, you're, you're the uh, committee chair of the Honolulu Committee. Did I get that right? That's correct. Of the, of the Transpac. That's, that's right. Race. What happens after the boats leave California, everything starts falling in our lap, um, unless there's an issue at sea or something like that. But... Mm -hmm. For the most part, the entire race moves to Hawaii. And what we have to do is, in a perfect world, we would schedule them when they finish and arrange the parties at certain times and we'd all go to sleep. But that's not the way it works. It starts that way, but it doesn't finish that way. So this year we'll have 106, well, I'll say over 100 boats that are going to finish here in Hawaii. Every one of them is going to cross the Diamond Head finish line. We have to communicate with every boat. So it, once they start getting close to Hawaii, it starts setting off all kinds of um, happenings. Like what? Uh, first of all, the communications start coming in. We start notifying uh, from the welcoming committee to the families and friends of the boat. We start sending out word the boat. We have an ETA of this time. This must be very exciting and very <laughs> it fun. Is. 
So, what a great job to have to tell everybody that their boat's coming in. That's right. So there's, there's all of these committees that um, work towards do this. And Diamond Head Lighthouse then has the first real physical contact with the boat. They see them. They finish them. They hand them off to a follow me boat, which is a boat waiting for them at the Diamond Head buoy to escort them to wherever their mooring is going well, to be. There's an important point there is that when they're making the trip from Long Beach, there's no follow me boat. No. They're by themselves. They're independent, self-reliant. Uh, they can't have a follow boat. Yeah. That's right. They only get the follow boat when they, when they come in close. At That's the right. And, and that's to get them through our reefs and stuff and right. get them safely yeah. into our harbors. Like pilot. And I can say, I don't remember if it was two years ago or four years ago, but we had a major south swell which closed all the harbors on the south side, and we had to hold the boats off as they finished off of Waikiki, and we had boats out there to keep them at a distance, and they were not allowed to come oh, into the harbor. harbor. Yeah, You it, could wreck your boat. Yes. <laughs> Yes, and that was an incredible job for to get them into the harbor the next day because the swells were still very dangerous, but they weren't closed out anymore. So they come in, they, they, they finish at Diamond Head uh, Buoy there, Diamond mm -hmm. Head Light. Are people up there, there in the light? Because you can walk up to the top of the light. They're up there with uh, binoculars watching for them. There's three Transpac personnel oh, up there. there. Are, yeah. That's it. I want that job. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so they, you know, they announced the finish. And then the follow me boat escorts him. It's about 45 minutes. Then there's the voice of Transpac that welcomes him into the Alawai Harbor through loudspeakers, et cetera. Uh, cool. And then they're taken down to their slip. And there's a, a group of pier operations uh, personnel that tie them up, keep everybody on the boat. Except make, it, make sure enough slips are available. That's 106 right. Six boats. So it takes 106 slips. <laughs> then what happens is the inspections committee hops on board and they do the necessary inspections and sign off on necessary paperwork. We have to deal with Department of Agriculture, collect those forms, oh, sure. those inspections. Um, at some point in time, after the dust settles, um, then the Mai Tais come on board <laughs> and there's a crew photo taken with everybody on the deck of the boat holding their pineapple Mai Tai. And their it's layers. the famous part of the right. race. And their ways, that's right. And the family's just going crazy. Families, you know, the girlfriends, boyfriends, whoever it may be, they're waiting for them. And then there's a party hosted by the Ohana here in Hawaii. The, the, trans, the Transpac Ohana. That's right. One great big party. Yeah. For each one gets an individual oh, each party. Each one gets a separate party. Okay, yes. wow. And um, it's, it's known as the best aloha welcome of any yacht race we in the world. We would expect nothing less, Carl. And we will not give him anything <laughs> but the best. Okay, so they, they may stay here for a little vacation in a few days. The boat stays in the slip at Alawai, was it? Um, now, what happens after that? They, do they head on back to where they came from? Well, so, uh, some boats go cruising mm -hmm. for a little while. Some uh, have the delivery crews get ready to load them up, provision them, put fuel on, and sail them to their next point, uh -huh. their next race. They or can't back use the West a motor Coast. during, the, not, during not, the trip, but afterward they can use a the motor. Yeah. And then uh, some of the boats uh, go down to Cahey uh, or Sand Island, and the rigs are taken down, the boats are lifted out of the water and put on cradles, and then they're uh, put on uh, Pasha, Oh. And or Matson or that other transported back and on transported ship. back on a ship. Why not sail them back? Uh, some of the owners don't want to put the wear and tear on these machines of extra miles, particularly going upwind. And to get back to the west coast, you got to go pretty hard north for a long right. time it's before you tackle it. Is much to harder, west. Yeah, right. okay. And it's harder on the boats yeah. and the, the sails, the rigs. Uh, so if Guys, if guys can write the check to have the boat ship, they prefer to do that. Yes. Uh, interesting. There's some other interesting things that happen, though. Once they're here, uh, race headquarters coordinates a lot of activities, and that's in the LOI Yacht Harbor. But oh. also, we have the award ceremony, and this time, the first time ever, it's going to be the at the White. Nice. Yes, it's going to be at the White Convention Center because the group is so big. Uh, that's the only facility that can hold all the, the participants and their family and friends. So that happens on Friday, July 26th. I'm going to make a note of that because I'd like to come down there and take pictures yeah. of it, you know. Ooh. <laughs> um, so, uh, one last question for you guys. We're almost out of time. And that is, where, where is this all going? It's been in existence uh, since, uh, what, uh, 1906? Um, it's going strong. That's the title of our show. It's going strong. 
Um, well, this is our big, is this going? is our biggest race. It's we got 106 or 107 entries right now. Uh, the prior record was 80. So by being the 50th golden anniversary, it's it's really really big this year. Uh, but the the race kind of ebbs and flows with international economics. When the economies get softer, there's just less people. It, this takes a lot of discretionary income to, to yeah, yeah. do the race. Yeah. Um, well, these but, sports activities are always useful for the state, aren't they? Oh, well, think about all these people that are flying in to see their friends and families finish. Right. They're staying in hotels. Right. These owners have a lot of money. They're in very ex nice restaurants and buying a lot of booze for their crews. Their crews are generally being put up in hotels and timeshares in Waikiki. Uh, then there's crew dinners at, at all our restaurants in town. Then there's the uh, Hawaii Yacht Club and Waikiki Yacht Club have big uh, parties, sell a lot of tickets with a lot of entertainment. Uh, so there's, and then you know, there's going to be 105 separate parties. So there's a pretty big economic impact uh, on uh, Waikiki. For this race, all those parties. I guess I'm really curious to know. Um, you know, you have your official duties here, gentlemen, as part of the committee and everything in the board. How are you going to get to visit 106 or seven parties? That's a real chore. I hope you can work that out without, you know, without stressing yourself too much. We'll do our best. <laughs> <laughs> We've had practice. Yes, <laughs> practice <laughs> makes perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Carl. Thank you. Carl Geringer. And Bo, thank you thank very you. much. Bo Wheeler. Great discussion. Good luck on the race. Thanks so thank much. Thank you. <laughs>